In previous videos, we discussed the developments that led to the theory of quantum mechanics. Sadi Carnot's study of the efficiency of the steam engine inspired Rudolf Clausius to develop the theory of thermodynamics. Ludwig Boltzmann then introduced statistical mechanics to explain the laws of thermodynamics in terms of molecules that randomly move around according to the laws of Newtonian mechanics. Several results of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics hinted at the idea that energy is quantized. For example, the blackbody radiation law relates the temperature of an object to the wavelength spectrum of the radiation that it emits. The formula that correctly describes this relation in agreement with experimental data could not be derived with the classical laws of Newtonian mechanics and electromagnetic radiation. Rather, Max Planck had to assume that the energy of oscillating charges is quantized. Another example is the heat capacity of solids at low temperatures. The heat capacity of an object describes how much heat is required to raise the temperature of the object by a certain amount. According to the equipartition theorem of classical thermodynamics, the heat capacity for solids should not depend on temperature. But according to experimental data, the heat capacity decreases to zero as the temperature goes to zero. Einstein demonstrated that this behavior can be explained if we assume that the vibrational energies of the atoms inside a solid are quantized. Moreover, Einstein noted that the formula for the entropy of radiation closely resembles the formula for the entropy of a collection of particles. According to these formulas, each particle of radiation would need to have an amount of energy that is exactly the same as required to explain the photoelectric effect and photoionization. These phenomena both have to do with how radiation can knock electrons free from atoms. Another major contributor, perhaps the largest contributor to the development of quantum mechanics, was the study of atomic spectral lines. It was observed experimentally that each element can emit radiation only at a certain set of distinct wavelengths. This could not be explained with classical Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism. Instead, Niels Bohr postulated a model of the atom where the angular momentum of the orbiting electron is quantized. In the developments that followed, more and more quantization rules were formulated to make sense of all the observations. However, these rules were introduced ad hoc and were not systematically derived from a coherent general theory of quantum mechanics. This description of quantum mechanics is now known as the old quantum theory. Development of the first general coherent theory of quantum mechanics was started by Werner Heisenberg and it was further refined with Pasquale Jordan and Max Born, and more independently by Paul Dirac. The initial construction of the theory was inspired by the quantum description of optical dispersion. In Hendrik Lorentz's classical description of dispersion, the dispersion of light is caused by electron oscillations. Resonances in the dispersion curve should, according to the theory, be observed at the electron's natural oscillation frequencies. However, experimental observations showed dispersion resonances at the transition frequencies of Bohr's atomic model. These transition frequencies are unrelated to the oscillation frequencies that Lorentz's theory relies on. So, a new theory of optical dispersion was formulated, where the dispersion resonances occur at the transition frequencies. The resulting quantum formula for optical dispersion was interpreted in terms of virtual oscillators. It was not clear what these virtual oscillators represented physically. But what's important is that they oscillate at the transition frequencies as defined in Bohr's atomic model. To figure out how one should calculate with these virtual oscillators, it was noted that in the classical limit, these virtual oscillators correspond to the Fourier coefficients of classical electron orbits. By examining how one calculates with Fourier coefficients, it was concluded that one should calculate with virtual oscillators according to the rules of matrix multiplication. 
And so, quantum theory was described using matrix mechanics. The creators of this formalism emphasized that this theory is fundamentally unintuitive and not visualizable. That is, whereas in classical theory and the old quantum theory one could draw a picture of an electron orbit, it is not possible now that the electron position is described by a matrix instead of a scalar. Completely unrelated to optical dispersion and virtual oscillators, a different line of reasoning was being developed to construct a coherent theory of quantum mechanics. In this line of reasoning, Louis de Broglie proposed that if light waves can act as particles, then particles, such as electrons, can act as waves. This would explain Sommerfeld's quantization condition, which dictates what electron orbits are allowed to exist. By modeling the electron as a wave, the quantization condition is simply the requirement that the electron wave constructively interferes with itself as it is orbiting. Moreover, in the Davis and Germer experiment, it was experimentally demonstrated that electrons can form diffraction patterns, which is a typical wave phenomenon. Nobel laureate Felix Bloch recalled how Aaron Schrödinger was inspired to develop the Broglie's hypothesis into a complete formalism of wave mechanics for quantum theory. Peter Debye requested that Schrödinger give a talk about the Broglie's thesis. After Schrödinger's talk, Debye commented that it's childish to talk about the wave nature of particles without providing a wave equation. So, Schrödinger set out to find a wave equation, and sometime later he found one. The way he found the equation was through an analogy with optics. Light used to be thought of as rays, which have definite positions and travel in straight lines with definite directions. Upon closer inspection, it was found that light is a wave, which is spread out over space and which can diffract around obstacles. In the same way that we transition from the ray model of light to the wave model of light, we now transition from the particle model of matter to the wave model of matter. In his paper, he describes in more detail the relation between ray optics and wave optics, and how this relation inspires an analogous relation between particle mechanics and wave mechanics. In optics, the rays of light travel in a direction perpendicular to the wave fronts. This establishes the relation between rays and waves. The relation between particle mechanics and ray optics is that the trajectories of both particles and rays are described by minimization principles. Rays follow the path of least time, as described by Fermat's principle, and particles follow the path of least action as described by Hamilton's principle. Therefore, the paths of particles in mechanics are analogous to the trajectories of rays in optics. This analogy between mechanics and optics had already been well developed by Sir William Rowan Hamilton a century before Schrödinger started working on quantum mechanics. In fact, Hamilton formulated his principle of least action inspired by Fermat's principle of least time. This led to the formalism of Hamiltonian mechanics which became widely used, but the fact that an analogy with optics inspired its development was mostly forgotten. Even if it was remembered, it was considered nothing more than a mathematical curiosity. But Schrödinger re-examined this analogy between optics and mechanics, and he used it to develop a wave theory of mechanics that can reproduce the results of quantum theory. In the following, we will see in more detail how Schrödinger derived his wave equation, how this wave equation reproduces the results of the old quantum theory, and how we can interpret this new theory of matter waves. To derive Schrödinger's equation, we start by examining in more detail the analogy between optics and mechanics. In particular, let's recall their two minimization principles, Fermat's principle of least time, and Hamilton's principle of least action. In optics, consider the case where we have two media with different refractive indices. If a ray of light starts propagating from point A and reaches the interface between the two media at a certain angle, 
then the ray of light refracts, and it ends up at some point B. One can calculate how the light ray refracts by using Snell's law. This law tells you explicitly how the angle of incidence relates to the angle of refraction. Alternatively, we can use Fermat's principle of least time to determine the trajectory of the ray. In this case, we start by choosing the starting point A and the endpoint B of the trajectory. To determine how the light ray will go from A to B, we consider all the trajectories that the ray could in principle take. For each trajectory, we calculate the time it would take for the light ray to travel from A to B. We calculate the travel time by dividing the distance by the velocity of the light. The velocity of light is inversely proportional to the refractive index of the medium it is traveling in. Therefore, the travel time is proportional to a quantity called the optical path length, which is defined as the physical path length times the refractive index. We compare this travel time for all trajectories, and the trajectory for which this travel time is the least is the trajectory that the light ray will actually follow. Now let's consider the analogous situation in classical mechanics. For simplicity, we consider only one spatial dimension and examine how a particle moves along that dimension as a function of time. Along that spatial dimension, there is a sudden jump in the potential energy. If a particle starts at a certain point in space and time, moving with a certain velocity, then it has a total energy given by the sum of its kinetic energy and potential energy. When the particle reaches the region with a lower potential, then by the conservation of energy, its kinetic energy must increase, so it will travel at a higher velocity and it will reach some other point in space and time. Instead of using energy conservation, we can use Hamilton's principle of least action to find the particle's trajectory. In this method, we define the starting point and end point of the particle in space and time. We consider all the possible trajectories the particle could take from point A to point B in the specified amount of time. For each trajectory, we calculate a quantity called the action. To calculate it, we define the Lagrangian, which calculates for each point along the trajectory the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the particle. If we integrate this Lagrangian over the time it takes for the particle to go from point A to point B, we find the action. The trajectory that the particle will actually take is the one for which the action is minimal. So both the trajectory of a light ray and the trajectory of a particle can be determined by some minimization principle. We can further extend this analogy between optics and mechanics. In optics, we know that light is more accurately modeled as a wave, and we know how the ray model of light is related to the wave model of light. Therefore, we can ask if by analogy, we can extend the particle model of mechanics to a wave model of mechanics. In optics, we know that the light rays are perpendicular to the wave fronts. Therefore, if in mechanics we know a particle's trajectory, we can construct wave fronts that are perpendicular to this trajectory. In optics, these wave fronts are surfaces where the complex phase of the wave function is constant. Therefore, if we are going to construct a wave function of the particle, we do it such that the complex phase is constant along the wave fronts that we inferred from the particle's trajectory. In optics, the phase of the wave function is proportional to the optical path length that the light has traveled. The optical path length is the quantity that is minimized in Fermat's principle. Therefore, it stands to reason that the phase of a particle's wave function is given by the action, which is minimized in Hamilton's principle. Now let's verify mathematically that it would make sense to interpret the action as the phase of a particle's wave function. The direction in which the particle travels must be perpendicular to the wave fronts, which are surfaces of constant phase. The direction in which a particle travels is given by its momentum vector, and the direction perpendicular to the surfaces of constant phase is given by the gradient of the phase. 
Therefore, to demonstrate that it makes sense to interpret the action as the complex phase of a particle's wave function, we must demonstrate that the particle's momentum vector points in the same direction as the gradient of the action. To calculate the gradient of the phase, we see how the action changes when we slightly shift the trajectory's endpoint in space. Given the new endpoint, we find a new trajectory, and we can define the difference between the trajectories as a function of time. Note that, in particular, at the starting point the difference is zero, because we only move the endpoint. Therefore, the original trajectory is transformed to the original trajectory plus the difference. The velocity of the new trajectory is found by the original velocity plus the time derivative of the difference. The Lagrangian depends on both the position and the velocity of the particle. Therefore, to see how the Lagrangian is transformed, we must take the original Lagrangian and add to that the change in Lagrangian due to the difference in position, as well as the change in Lagrangian due to the difference in velocity. This difference in velocity is the time derivative of the difference in position. For both the original and the new trajectory of the particle, it must hold that its action is minimal. This means that the Euler-Lagrange equation must be satisfied in both cases, as was explained in a previous video. We use the Euler-Lagrange equation to rewrite the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to position. We can now recognize the two time derivatives as being the result of applying the product rule. We have now found an expression for how the Lagrangian changes when we slightly shift the spatial coordinate of the endpoint of the particle's trajectory. We will now use this result to see how the action changes as function of the spatial coordinates. The action is defined as the time integral of the Lagrangian. The time integral over the original Lagrangian gives the original action. The time integral over the difference in the Lagrangian can be calculated straightforwardly, since we integrate a time derivative. The result can be further simplified by recalling that the starting point of the trajectory didn't change. Therefore, we only have to plug in the change of the spatial coordinate at the end point. To further simplify the expression, we express the Euler-Lagrange equation in terms of the generalized force and generalized momentum, in analogy with Newton's second law. From this, it follows that a particle's momentum is given by the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity. We plug this result in the expression for the new action. We see that the difference in action, divided by the difference in the spatial coordinate of the endpoint, is equal to the particle's momentum at the original endpoint. This finite difference quotient represents the spatial derivative of the action, which for the one-dimensional case is the gradient of the action. By extending this argument to the three-dimensional case, we find that the particle's momentum points in the same direction as the gradient of the action, which is what we needed to show if we want to interpret the action as the complex phase of the particle's wave function. So by looking at the spatial derivative of the action, we have demonstrated that the action can plausibly be interpreted as the complex phase of a particle's wave function. Now, we will see how this phase evolves in time by looking at the time derivative of the action. To evaluate the partial derivative with respect to time, we should look at how the action changes when we only change the time of the trajectory's endpoint. However, we can calculate it more easily when we calculate the full time derivative. That is, we let the particle follow its trajectory for a slightly longer time, which means that both the time and position of the endpoint change. Let's consider the action of the original trajectory and the action for the trajectory with the new endpoint. We calculate this new action in two different ways, and then we compare the two expressions. The first way to calculate the new action is by simply adding to the original action integral the integrand times the extra time interval. The reason why this is valid is because we extend the particle's trajectory, 
which means that the part of the trajectory until the original endpoint remains unchanged. The second way to calculate the new action is by writing the difference due to the full-time derivative in terms of the partial derivatives with respect to both time and position. When we subtract the two expressions, we find a relation between the Lagrangian and the partial derivatives of the action. We already found that the spatial derivative equals the momentum. When we divide both sides by the time interval, we can express the partial time derivative of the action as the Lagrangian minus momentum times velocity. This is precisely the negative of the Legendre transform that yields the Hamiltonian. Usually, the Hamiltonian denotes the total energy of the system. Therefore, the partial time derivative of the action, or phase, equals minus the particle's energy. So we found that the gradient of the action equals the particle's momentum vector, and the time derivative of the action equals minus the energy of the particle. We now suppose that the particle can be described by a wave function, whose complex phase is proportional to the action, by some proportionality constant k. We can locally approximate the wave function as a plane wave by linearizing the action around a fixed point in time and space. We can compare this expression to the general expression of a plane wave in terms of wave number, which is related to the wavelength, and the angular frequency. To find the constant of proportionality, we recall some known results of quantum mechanics. If we choose the constant to be 1 divided by the reduced Planck's constant h-bar, we find that the action's gradient divided by h-bar equals the wave vector. By equating the action's gradient to the momentum vector, and writing the magnitude of the wave vector in terms of the wavelength lambda, we find the relation between momentum and wavelength, as was found previously by de Broglie. Moreover, when we relate the time derivative of the action to the angular frequency, and express this relation in terms of the particle's energy, we find the relation between energy and frequency, as was previously found by Einstein. Therefore, we have made plausible that the wave function of a particle is one whose phase equals the action divided by h-bar. Moreover, if we recall from wave theory the expression for the wave's phase velocity, we find that it is equal to the particle's energy divided by its momentum. We will use this result when we derive Schrödinger's equation. To derive Schrödinger's equation, recall that the time derivative of the action equals minus the particle's energy. If the energy is conserved, then the energy does not depend on time and we find that the action is a fixed function of position minus the energy times time. The particle's wave function has a phase which is equal to the action divided by h-bar. If we assume that for a single constant energy, the amplitude of the wave function doesn't change in time, then we can split the wave function into a position-dependent part and a time-dependent part. To find the wave equation that describes the particle's wave function, we start with the generic wave equation with the phase velocity c. We found a moment ago that for a particle, this phase velocity equals the particle's energy divided by its momentum. When we write the total energy as the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, we can express the momentum in terms of energy. We will now combine these results to find Schrödinger's wave equation. First, we rewrite the wave equation by separating the wave function in a position-dependent part and a time-dependent part. Then we plug in the expression for the phase velocity. If we then rearrange the terms, we find the equation that is nowadays known as the time-independent Schrödinger equation. To find the full Schrödinger equation, we use the fact that in optics, a general wave function with a time-dependent amplitude can be written as the sum of monochromatic waves. That is, to find the total wave function, we add together waves that each have a single angular frequency. In quantum mechanics, this angular frequency is related to energy. 
So the general wave function consists of a sum of wave functions with different energies. The time-independent Schrödinger equation, which involves only a single energy, can be recovered if we substitute the energy with a time derivative. This way, if we assume that the wave function is monochromatic, we can derive the time-independent Schrödinger equation from the time-dependent equation. The resulting equation is nowadays known as the Schrödinger equation, which is typically written more generally in terms of a Hamiltonian operator that acts on the wave function. Now that we have derived the wave equation for a particle's wave function, we must verify that it can reproduce all the results from the old quantum theory. So let's recap the results which were already known and which we're trying to rederive with Schrödinger's wave equation. The first result is Niels Bohr's model of the atom. To explain the existence of spectral lines, he proposed that the electron can occupy only a discrete set of orbits around the atom's nucleus. In the case of the hydrogen atom, the energies of these orbits were calculated and successfully compared to experimental results. The frequency of the radiation that is emitted when an electron drops from one energy level to another is related to the difference in energy levels. This model of the atom was refined by Arnold Sommerfeld to explain the splitting of spectral lines by electric or magnetic fields. Just like in Bohr's atomic model, electrons can only occupy a discrete set of orbits with certain energies. The larger the radius of the orbit, the higher the electron's energy. But in addition, for each energy level, there are multiple orbits with different values for angular momentum. These values are also quantized, and they determine how elliptical the orbit is. Moreover, an electron orbit can have different orientations in space. For different orientations, the electrons still have the same energy, and these orientations are also quantized. When different electron states have the same energy, we say that there is degeneracy. From a theoretical point of view, these results can be derived from Sommerfeld's quantization condition. For each of the three spatial dimensions, there is a quantization condition, so we end up with three quantum numbers. For each value of the quantum number that determines the energy, there are multiple values for the quantum number that determines angular momentum. And for each value of angular momentum, there are multiple values for the spatial orientation. This degeneracy explains the splitting of spectral lines in the presence of an electric or magnetic field. When no field is applied, all these different orbits have the same energy, so they all yield a spectral line with the same frequency. But because the orbits have different shapes and orientations, they will respond differently to an externally applied field. Therefore, when an external field is applied, Orbits that used to have the same energy now have different energies. We say that the degeneracy is lifted. Because the orbits now have different energies, the spectral lines are split. So to summarize, the problem is the following. We start with Schrödinger's wave equation. From that, we want to calculate the energy levels of the hydrogen atom as found by Bohr, and we want to demonstrate that the orbit of an electron is described by three quantum numbers, as found by Sommerfeld. When we can reproduce these results of the old quantum theory, we have made plausible that quantum mechanics can be explained by using Schrödinger's wave model for particles. So let's start by writing down the Schrödinger equation. It contains an operator called the Laplacian, which in Cartesian coordinates is straightforwardly expressed as a sum of second derivatives with respect to the three spatial coordinates. However, the problem of the hydrogen atom contains spherical symmetry. Therefore, it is better to consider the Schrödinger equation in spherical coordinates, rather than Cartesian coordinates. The question then is, how do we express the Laplacian in spherical coordinates? Let's start by recalling the definition of spherical coordinates and their relation to the Cartesian coordinates. When we consider some vector in three-dimensional space with respect to a Cartesian coordinate system, 
we can define the length of the vector r. The polar angle theta is the angle the vector makes with the z-axis. It ranges from 0 to pi. We can calculate the projection of the vector onto the xy plane. The azimuthal angle phi defines the angle that the projection makes with the x-axis. It ranges from 0 to 2 pi. Using the figure, we see that the z component of the vector is given by the length of the vector times the cosine of the polar angle. The x and y coordinates are found by multiplying the projection onto the xy plane with the cosine and the sine of the azimuthal angle respectively. We can also use the figure to express the spherical coordinates in terms of Cartesian coordinates. Now let's recall the definition of the Laplacian in Cartesian coordinates, which we want to express in spherical coordinates. First consider the single derivative with respect to x. This derivative can be expressed in terms of derivatives with respect to the spherical coordinates by using the chain rule. We will now calculate the derivatives of the spherical coordinates with respect to x. The derivative of r with respect to x is found straightforwardly from the expression for r in terms of the Cartesian coordinates. However, the current expression still contains the Cartesian coordinate x, even though we want an expression purely in terms of the spherical coordinates. Therefore, we substitute the expression for x in terms of spherical coordinates. Now we consider the derivative of the polar angle theta with respect to x. Again, we use the expression of theta in terms of the Cartesian coordinates, and then we rewrite all the Cartesian coordinates in terms of spherical coordinates. By using some trigonometric identities, we can further simplify the expression. Also for the final derivative of the polar angle phi with respect to x, we first calculate the derivative in terms of Cartesian coordinates, and then express them in terms of spherical coordinates. We have now found how we can express the derivative with respect to x in terms of spherical coordinates. However, in the Laplacian we don't use the first derivative with respect to x, but the second derivative. To find the second derivative, we take the expression we found for the first derivative and then apply it to itself. Then we need to plug in the expressions we found for the derivatives of the spherical coordinates with respect to the Cartesian coordinates. We can see how this single term is already quite elaborate. There are two more such terms in the expression for the second derivative with respect to x. On top of that, the Laplacian furthermore contains the second derivatives with respect to y and z. Therefore, finding the final result requires several pages of meticulous bookkeeping, which we're not going to do here. Instead, we state the final result and a reference where all the steps are worked out in detail. But hopefully, showing the first few steps of the derivation gives at least a feeling for how this final result is obtained. We have now rewritten the time-independent Schrodinger equation in terms of spherical coordinates. The next step in solving the equation consists of using a standard method called the separation of variables. In this method, we assume that the wave function, which is a function of the three spherical coordinates, can be written as a product of functions of only a single variable. The general solution can be written as a linear combination of such products. We plug this expression into the Schrodinger equation. We then divide both sides of the equation by the wave function and multiply both sides by the square of the radial coordinate. In the resulting expression, we can collect the terms that only depend on the radial coordinates and equate them to an expression that depends only on the polar and azimuthal angle. We now have an expression that depends only on the radial coordinates, which is equal to an expression that depends only on the angular coordinates. Since the right side does not vary with the radial coordinates, the left side cannot vary either. Therefore, the left side must be a constant, and therefore, the right side must be equal to the same constant. So we can rewrite this equation as two separate equations, which state that each side of the equation is equal to the same separation constant, a. 
Now we apply the same trick to the equation that depends on the angular coordinates. That is, we rewrite the expression such that the left side of the equation depends only on the polar angle, and the right side depends only on the azimuthal angle. Therefore, both sides of the equation must equal the same separation constant, b. So by writing the Schrodinger equation in spherical coordinates, and applying the method of separation of variables, we turn the Schrodinger equation that depends on three variables into three separate equations, which each depend on only a single variable. Now we have to solve each of these three equations. The simplest equation is the one involving the azimuthal angle. The solution to this differential equation is an exponential function which should satisfy the boundary condition that is periodic with period 2 pi. This condition is similar to de Broglie's condition for allowable electron orbits. If the electron wave function has completed an orbit, it should be in phase with itself. This implies that the square root of the separation constant is an integer. So we substitute the separation constant with a squared integer m. Next, we solve the equation with the polar angle. First, we apply a change of variables. Instead of using a function of theta, we use a function of cosine theta. Note that theta is evaluated on the interval 0 to pi. So cosine theta is evaluated on the interval minus 1 to 1. To rewrite the derivative with respect to theta as a derivative with respect to cosine theta, we apply the chain rule. When we apply the change in variables, we change the functions of theta into functions of cosine theta, and we change the derivatives with respect to theta into derivatives with respect to cosine theta. Because 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared, we obtain a differential equation purely in terms of cosine theta. We multiply both sides of the equation by p divided by 1 minus x squared and move all the terms to one side. We can compare the resulting equation to the so-called general Legendre equation, which is solved by the associated Legendre polynomials. The equations are the same if the separation constant a is equal to minus some number l times l plus 1. This number l has to be a sufficiently large integer if the solution should be free of any singularities in the interval minus 1 to 1. Therefore, we can write the separation constant a as minus some integer l times l plus 1, where l has to be larger than the absolute value of n. We can substitute this expression for the separation constant in the equations and keep in mind the requirements for the constant l. Now we can solve the final equation, which involves the radial coordinate r. First, we apply a change of variables, where we multiply the unknown function with r. We express the derivative of the original function in terms of the new function, u. We use this result to further rewrite the term that occurs in the differential equation. We find that the term reduces to r times a second derivative. We substitute this expression into the differential equation to find the differential equation for the new function u. When we divide both sides by r squared, multiply by u, and multiply by h bar squared over 2m, we find an equation that has the same form as the original Schrödinger equation, except that it is one-dimensional instead of three-dimensional, and the potential has acquired an extra term. We divide both sides of the equation by the total energy E, and we plug in the expression for the Coulomb potential that is generated by the nucleus of the atom. We rescale the radial coordinate so that we leave out some constant factors in the equation. This rescaling also scales the derivative by a constant factor. When we write the differential equation in terms of the rescaled radial coordinate, we find that the constant factor drops out in two terms, while another factor is included in the term involving the potential energy. We can lump together the overall constant factor in another constant parameter. With this new parameter, 
we can greatly simplify the expression for the differential equation. So after introducing three new definitions, we arrive at a relatively compact differential equation. To solve this equation, let's look at its asymptotic behavior. When the rescaled radial coordinate rho is large, then only the term that is equal to the function u remains. The solution to the resulting differential equation, which does not diverge for large rho, is an exponential function with a negative exponent. In the other asymptotic case, where the rescaled radial coordinate rho is very small, the term proportional to 1 over rho squared will be dominant. The solution to the resulting differential equation, which does not diverge for small rho, is rho to the power l plus 1. Now that we know how the function behaves asymptotically, we only need to solve for the deviations from that asymptotic solution. To do this, we define yet another function, where the asymptotic behaviors have been removed. Once more, we need to rewrite a differential equation in terms of a new function. We can simply substitute any occurrences of the old function with the expression for the new function, but to rewrite the derivatives we have to do some more work. We first calculate the first derivative with respect to rho, and then use that result to calculate the second derivative. When we make these two substitutions, we end up with a differential equation that seems more complicated than our initial equation. But as we will see soon, the benefit of this new equation is that it can be reduced to a standard form with known solutions. To obtain that standard form, we rescale the rescaled radial coordinate once more, this time by a factor of 2. We apply the substitution in the differential equation and then divide both sides of the equation by 2. The resulting equation is a standard differential equation known as the associated Laguerre differential equation, which is solved by the associated Laguerre polynomials. These solutions contain no singularities only if the parameter n is a non-negative integer. Therefore, the constant rho zero must be a sufficiently large integer. When we plug in the definition for rho zero and solve for the energy E, then we find exactly the energy levels that were found by Bohr. Moreover, in solving the Schrödinger equation for the hydrogen atom, we derive three quantum numbers with certain allowed values which are completely consistent with Sommerfeld's atomic model. In his book Atomic Structure and Spectral Lines, Sommerfeld explains how, for hydrogen, the three quantum numbers and their allowed values can be derived from his quantization condition of the old quantum theory. He shows that the energy quantum number n can be written as the sum of an azimuthal and a radial quantum number, and that the azimuthal quantum number is related to the quantum number l. Similarly, the azimuthal quantum number can be written as the sum of the so-called equatorial and latitudinal quantum numbers and the equatorial quantum number is related to the quantum number n. In Sommerfeld's atomic model, the quantum numbers describe the shapes and orientations of well-defined elliptical orbits. In Schrödinger's wave mechanics, there is no well-defined orbit, but rather a spread-out wave function, which is therefore not called an orbit, but an orbital. The three quantum numbers now determine the shapes of these orbitals. With some imagination, we can still see how the quantum number n defines the size of the orbital, l defines its ellipticity, and m defines its orientation. We just saw how Schrödinger's equation successfully reproduces some important results of the old quantum theory. For example, it finds the correct energy levels of the hydrogen atom, which were already known from the Bohr model. However, we haven't yet addressed the other key point of the Bohr model, namely that radiation is emitted with a frequency that is proportional to the difference between energy levels. How do we explain this in Schrödinger's wave mechanics? Recall that a general wave function can be written as a superposition of waves with different energies. In optics, 
one would say that an arbitrary optical field can be written as a sum of monochromatic fields. In optics, the intensity of a field is given by its squared modulus. If we calculate the squared modulus of a quantum mechanical wave function, we find terms that oscillate with frequencies which are exactly the same as the radiation frequencies in the Bohr model. From classical electrodynamics, we know that if an electric charge is oscillating with a certain frequency, then it emits radiation with the same frequency. Therefore, if we interpret the squared modulus of the electron's wave function as a charge density, we could make sense of the spectral line frequencies. This is indeed what Schrodinger proposed. The physical meaning that he assigned to the quantum mechanical wave function was that it is a fluctuating electrical charge spread out in space. In this way, he explained why the radiation frequencies coincide with the differences of energy levels, divided by Planck's constant. In the following, we will study in more detail how an oscillating charge distribution emits radiation according to classical electrodynamics. And we will see how this analysis helps us understand the relation between Schrodinger's wave mechanics and Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Suppose we have some charges distributed over a small volume, around the size of an atom. What would such an atomic charge distribution look like to an observer that is much larger? If the amount of positive charge is equal to the amount of negative charge, then to a first approximation, it looks like the atom has no electric charge. This is called the monopole approximation, which is basically the total charge of the charge distribution. Now suppose that the amount of positive charge is still equal to the amount of negative charge, but all the positive charge is lumped together on one side, and all the negative charge is lumped together on the other side. The total charge is still zero, but if we were to approximately describe this charge distribution, we could do better than to just add all the charges together. Instead, we can approximate it as a dipole. This dipole would have to be defined with a certain orientation. Therefore, in the dipole approximation, we approximate the charge distribution with a vector, which indicates more precisely how the charges are distributed throughout the volume. Let's work out the mathematical details of this dipole approximation. First, recall the expression for the electric potential of a single charge, which is a Coulomb potential. The potential decreases with the distance r to the charge, which we can write in terms of Cartesian coordinates. We can call this the potential of a monopole. Now let's look at the potential of a dipole which is a positive charge and a negative charge, which are separated by some distance. To find the potential of these two charges, we simply sum together the potentials of each individual charge. Because the charges have the same magnitude, but opposite signs and slightly different locations, we obtain a difference in slightly shifted monopole potentials, which we can approximate using a derivative. When we calculate this derivative, we find a compact expression for the potential of a dipole. In this particular case, we chose the separation between the charges to be along the z-direction. If the charges are separated along any arbitrary direction, we have to look at the separation in all directions x, y, z. We obtain a dot product between the coordinate vector of the observation point and the vector that describes the magnitude of the charges and the separation between them. This vector is called the dipole moment. Now that we know what the potential of a dipole looks like, let's look at how we can approximate an arbitrary charge distribution as a dipole. The total potential of the entire distribution is given by the sum of the potentials of all the individual charges. Each individual charge has a coordinate vector which indicates its location with respect to some coordinate system. We evaluate the potential at some observation point, which is described by another coordinate vector. The potential due to a single charge as observed at the observation point 
depends on the distance between the observation point and the location of the charge. We can calculate this distance by using Pythagoras' theorem. If we also write down the expression for the distance between the observation point and the origin of the coordinate system, we can find the following approximation for the potential of a single charge. If the observation point is much farther away from the origin than the charge is, then the distance between the observation point and the charge is approximately equal to the distance between the observation point and the origin. A first correction to this approximation is found by using the gradient. We can calculate this gradient and substitute the result in the expression for the total potential of the charge distribution. We can identify a term that corresponds to the monopole approximation. That is, we approximate the charge distribution as simply the sum of all charges. Furthermore, we find the next term in the approximation, which resembles the expression for the dipole potential, where the dipole moment is given by the sum of all charges multiplied by their coordinate vectors. This is the definition we find for the dipole moment of a distribution of discrete charges. Higher order corrections to this approximation are given by what's called the multipole expansion. If we instead consider a continuous charge distribution, the summation is replaced by an integral. Each component of the dipole moment is given by the integral of the charge distribution multiplied by either the x, y or z coordinates. In the context of quantum mechanics, the relevance of the dipole approximation is the following. Schrödinger interpreted the squared modulus of the wave function as a continuous charge distribution. This charge distribution oscillates with frequencies that correspond to differences between the energy levels of the electron. According to Bohr's model of the atom, these frequencies coincide with the radiation frequencies of the atom, which are observed in spectral lines. So if we interpret the squared modulus of the wave function as a continuous charge distribution, can we use classical electrodynamics to successfully explain the frequencies, intensities and polarization of atomic spectral lines? According to classical electrodynamics, radiation is emitted by oscillating charges. An oscillating charge distribution can be approximated with a multipole expansion. The first term in that expansion, which is the total charge, does not change in time, so it does not contribute to the radiation. The next largest term in the approximation is the dipole term. This term does oscillate in time, so it describes how the oscillating charge distribution emits radiation. By calculating the dipole moment, we can calculate from the wave function the intensity and the polarization of the spectral lines. To further move towards an understanding of how Schrödinger's wave mechanics is related to Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, we must look into some linear algebra. Recall that in the time-independent Schrödinger equation, some linear operation, called the Hamiltonian, is applied to the wave function, and the result should be the same wave function multiplied by a scalar, which is the energy. In the language of linear algebra, this is an eigenvalue equation, where the Hamiltonian operator can be thought of as a matrix, the wave function is an eigenvector of that matrix, and the energy is its eigenvalue. On physical grounds, we know that the energy must be real valued. From the theory of linear algebra, it then follows that the Hamiltonian operator is Hermitian. If a linear operator is Hermitian, it means that if we take the inner product of two functions and apply the operator to one of them, then it doesn't matter which function we apply it to. Furthermore, it follows that eigenvectors with different eigenvalues are orthogonal to each other. That is, the inner product of eigenvectors with different eigenvalues is zero. Moreover, if we normalize the eigenvectors, they form an orthonormal basis. This means that any vector can be written as a weighted sum of the eigenvectors, and the weights can be found by taking the inner product with the eigenvectors. 
Now that we can look at the Schrodinger equation in terms of vectors and orthonormal eigenvectors, let's consider the different ways in which vectors can be represented. Suppose we have some vector floating around in space. To describe it, we must define some basis vectors. We can then describe the vector in terms of the basis vectors. However, if we consider the same vector, but with different basis vectors, then we represent the same physical vector with different numbers. These two different representations of the vector are related by a basis transformation. This transformation tells you how the new basis vectors can be expressed in terms of the old basis vectors. For a second example of how the same vector can be represented in different ways, consider the vector to be a continuous function. More specifically, Let's say it's a sine wave that describes a sound wave of a certain pitch. We can describe the sound by specifying at each point in time how the air pressure oscillates. Alternatively, we could describe the same sound by specifying the frequency at which the air pressure oscillates. For example, if we say that the sound has a frequency of 440 Hz, we know what the sound is. Therefore, we can represent the function describing the same sound in two different ways, either in the time basis or in the frequency basis. The basis transformation, which is in this case a Fourier transform, can be described by expressing the new basis functions in terms of the old basis functions. It's not only the vectors that are represented differently in different bases. Also the operators have different representations. For example, consider the operator which, when applied to a vector, mirrors the vector along a certain axis. To find a representation for this operator, we define a set of basis vectors. We can represent the vector before and after the mirroring operation in terms of these basis vectors. By applying the operation to each of the basis vectors, we find the matrix that describes the operation in this basis. Now consider the same mirroring operation, but different basis vectors. Again, we can represent the vector before and after the mirroring operation in terms of these basis vectors. And by applying the operation to each of the basis vectors, we find the matrix that describes the operation in this new basis we see that the same mirroring operation can be described by different matrices depending on which basis we work with. As another example, consider the operation of taking the time derivative of a continuous function. If we express this operation in the frequency basis, we find that it becomes a multiplication with frequency. Therefore, the same operation can be described either as a derivative or a multiplication depending on whether we work in the time basis or the frequency basis. For this reason, it is important to make a clear distinction between the physical vector and its different representations in different bases. In quantum mechanics, we use Dirac notation to denote a physical vector, independent of any choice of basis. As long as we only use orthonormal bases, the inner product will always be the same. Therefore, we can write an inner product of vectors without specifying the basis we use. We write this inner product as the product of a bra vector and a cat vector, so that the inner product is denoted as a bracket. We now know how the wave function can be interpreted as a charge distribution, and how an oscillating charge distribution emits radiation. We also know how operators that act on functions have representations that depend on the basis in which we work. Now let's see how we can use these insights to connect Schrodinger's wave mechanics to Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. If we choose a set of basis vectors, then a linear operator can be represented as a matrix, whose matrix elements depend on the choice of basis. To find the values of these matrix elements, we can apply the operator to a basis function, and then we take the inner product with another basis function. Depending on which basis functions we chose, 
we find the value of one matrix element. In Dirac notation, we find a matrix element by putting the operator in between the bra vector and cat vector. So we know how to find the matrix representation of an operator if we know the basis vectors. Then the question is, in Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, what operators do the matrices represent, and in which basis? In Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, the Hamiltonian matrix, or energy matrix, is diagonal. This means that the basis vectors are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian operator. The eigenvalues are the diagonal elements of the matrix, which we know are the energies of the stationary states of the system. Recall that the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian operator are precisely what we find when we solve Schrodinger's equation. Now that we know what the basis vectors are, we can ask what is the matrix that represents the operator multiplied by the x-coordinate? That is, we know what this operation does in the position basis, but what does it do in the energy basis? To find the matrix representation of the multiply by x operator in the energy basis, we need to apply the operator to one energy basis function and take the inner product with another energy basis function. So the matrix elements are found by integrating the energy basis functions multiplied by x over all space. If we include the time dependence of the basis functions, then we find how the matrix elements depend on time. The time dependence is exactly the same as in Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Now let's see what these matrix elements represent physically. In Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, the elements represent virtual oscillators, which are responsible for emitting radiation with the frequencies that are observed in spectral lines. In Schrodinger's wave mechanics, an arbitrary wave function can be expressed as a linear combination of energy basis functions. Schrodinger interpreted the squared modulus of the wave function as a charge's density. When we take the squared modulus, the summation over the energy basis functions turns into a double sum of products of basis functions. To calculate the radiation that is emitted by the oscillating charge distribution, we calculate the dipole moment. The x component of the dipole moment is found by integrating the charge density multiplied by x over all of space. When we plug in the expression for the charge density, we find that the integral reduces to the matrix elements of the multiply by x operator, which are also the matrix elements of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Therefore, we found a close connection between Heisenberg's matrix mechanics and Schrodinger's wave mechanics. The virtual oscillators in matrix mechanics are simply the dipole moment of an oscillating charge distribution whose behavior is determined by Schrodinger's wave equation. Another fundamental equation in Heisenberg's matrix mechanics is the canonical commutation relation. This relation specifies the difference between multiplying the position matrix with the momentum matrix and multiplying the momentum matrix with the position matrix. Using our new insights from Schrodinger's wave mechanics, how can we better understand this relation? We found that the position matrix is nothing more than the operator multiply with position represented in the energy basis. Similarly then, the momentum matrix must also correspond to some operator that is expressed in the energy basis, but which can in principle also be expressed in the position basis. So we ask the question, what does the momentum operator do in the position basis? Recall the time-independent Schrodinger equation expressed in the position basis, and notice its similarity to the classical equation for energy conservation. From this we can already guess that the momentum operator in the position basis is a derivative multiplied with the reduced Planck's constant. But because we squared the momentum, we're still unsure about its sign. To find the sign of the operator, we observe that the energy is the eigenvalue of what seems to be an energy operator. The eigenvectors are states that have a single energy. 
Similarly, we can expect that the momentum operator should be such that its eigenvectors are states that have a single momentum, and its eigenvalues are the momenta. When we inferred the particle's wave function from classical mechanics, we already saw what the wave function of a particle is if it is to have a single momentum that is consistent with the Broglie's formula. If this is the eigenfunction of the momentum operator, and its eigenvalue is the momentum, then we know what the momentum operator should be in the position basis. So now we know that the momentum operator in the position basis is a derivative, and the position operator in the position basis is a multiplication. The corresponding matrices in Heisenberg's matrix mechanics are simply those same operators represented in the energy basis. Now that we know what these operators look like in the position basis, we can give a new interpretation to the canonical commutation relation as found in matrix mechanics. When we apply the commutator of the position and momentum operators to some function, and we express the operators in the position basis, then by applying the product rule, we recover the canonical commutation relation. Schrödinger concluded that there is an intimate connection between his newly developed wave mechanics and Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. The matrix elements are the components of the dipole moment of a charge distribution. This charge distribution is given by the squared modulus of the wave function that is found by solving Schrödinger's wave equation. But what Schrödinger found especially important was that his new theory seemed to signal a return to a more intuitive classical physics. The inventors of matrix mechanics stated explicitly that their theory cannot be visualized and cannot be understood through intuition. It was merely an abstract formalism that nonetheless gave all the correct results. On the other hand, Schrödinger's wave mechanics which gave the same results as matrix mechanics, seemed to be quite visualizable and intuitive. Particles just have to be modeled more accurately as waves on small scales. Just like in optics, light rays have to be modeled as waves on small scales. The wave function of an electron can be straightforwardly visualized as a charge distribution spread out in space. To find the radiation that is emitted by the oscillating charge distribution, we have to do nothing more than apply the well-known classical laws of electrodynamics. To further demonstrate the validity of the new wave mechanics, Schrödinger used it to explain the phenomenon of dispersion. We saw in a previous video that the quantum description of dispersion was a crucial inspiration for developing matrix mechanics. Therefore, it's important that it can also be explained with the new wave mechanics. First. Let's recap the theory of dispersion. Dispersion describes how the refractive index of a medium varies with the wavelength of light. In the classical Lorentz model, this phenomenon is explained as follows. Incident radiation with a certain frequency makes an electron in the medium oscillate. The frequency with which the electron oscillates is the same as the frequency of the incident radiation. An oscillating electron emits radiation with a frequency that is equal to the electron's oscillation frequency. The way that the electron responds to the incident radiation is determined by Newton's equation of motion, where it is assumed the electron has some natural oscillation frequency, and the incident radiation is an oscillating force that drives the electron's motion. By solving the equation of motion and examining how the radiation emitted by the oscillating electron interferes with the incident radiation, we find an expression for the refractive index of the medium, which depends on the electron's natural oscillation frequency and the frequency of the incident radiation. When the frequency of the incident radiation coincides with the electron's natural oscillation frequency, Resonance can be observed in the dispersion curve, and this resonance can be measured experimentally. The discrepancy between Lorentz's model and the experimental observations is the following. The measured resonance frequencies do not correspond to the frequency with which the electron orbits the atom's nucleus. Rather, 
they correspond to the frequencies observed in spectral lines, which, according to Bohr's theory of the atom, do not correspond to any oscillation of the electron, but rather to the transition of the electron between energy states. The challenge was to formulate a quantum model of dispersion, where the resonance frequencies correspond to the frequencies of spectral lines, rather than the orbital frequencies of the electron. To find this model, one would strongly rely on Bohr's correspondence principle. Therefore, the classical laws of electrodynamics which describe how an oscillating electron emits radiation can be linked to quantum processes, such as spontaneous and stimulated emission, which are described by Einstein's A and B coefficients. The resulting formula inspired the development of matrix mechanics. Our goal is to rederive this quantum formula for dispersion by using Schrödinger's wave mechanics. Before we're going to solve Schrödinger's equation, we recall the quantum formula for dispersion, and we're going to rewrite it such that we can compare it more easily to the solution of Schrödinger's equation. We previously expressed the polarization of a medium for a certain electron energy level in terms of the number of electrons the strength of the incident electric field, Einstein's A coefficients for spontaneous emission, the radiation frequencies corresponding to the different electron transitions, and the frequency of the incident radiation. We may include a factor of one-third if we assume the atoms are randomly oriented. Now we are going to rewrite the quantum dispersion formula in such a way that we can more easily derive it from Schrödinger's equation. The first thing we want to do is to write Einstein's A coefficients for spontaneous emission in terms of matrix elements. To do this, we recall the result from a previous video where we relate Einstein's A coefficient to the Fourier coefficients of an electron's oscillation by using the classical Larmor's formula and Bohr's correspondence principle. Furthermore, we recall the result that in the classical limit, the matrix elements correspond to the Fourier coefficients of the electron's oscillation, and that the matrix is Hermitian. We have now expressed Einstein's A coefficients in terms of matrix elements. We plug this result into the quantum dispersion formula. The two summations correspond to transitions from a higher state down to state n, and from state n to states below. Note that the two summations have opposite sign. If we define the frequencies for downward transitions to have opposite signs from the frequencies for upward transitions, we can collect the two summations into a single sum. Finally, we write the transition frequencies in terms of the difference in energy levels. We have now found the form of the quantum dispersion formula that we want to rederive by using Schrödinger's wave equation. We're going to derive the quantum dispersion formula as follows. We consider an atom where the orbiting electron is described with a wave function that is interpreted as a continuous charge distribution. The wave function is found by solving Schrödinger's equation where the potential energy is given by the Coulomb potential. Now we're going to see what happens when we shine light on the atom. The incident radiation is classically described as an oscillating electric field. We know from Einstein's theory of the photon that the incident radiation is more accurately described as discrete energy quanta. But for now we accept this semi-classical approximation. The incident radiation makes the electron charge distribution oscillate. And we saw that by calculating the dipole moment, we can find the radiation that is emitted. To describe the effect of the incident radiation, we must include the change it makes to the potential energy in the Schrödinger equation. Now we should solve the new Schrödinger equation. However, it would be very burdensome to solve the equation from scratch again given that we already know the solution in the case where there is no radiation. Therefore, we are not going to solve the equation from scratch. But instead, we are going to treat the extra term due to the incident radiation 
as a perturbation to the original equation. And we're going to see how this perturbation to the Schrodinger equation will perturb its solutions. Note that this perturbation oscillates in time. However, to understand how perturbation theory works, it's easier to start with a case where the perturbation is constant in time. So let's first consider the case where the atom is put in a constant electric field. The result of this perturbation is that the electron energy levels are shifted, which is called the Stark effect. As was mentioned previously, the perturbation lifts the degeneracy in the energy levels, which results in the splitting of spectral lines. It was this observation that inspired the Sommerfeld model of the atom, with its quantized elliptical orbits. So let's calculate how the constant electric field perturbs the electron energies and wave functions. In the unperturbed state, the electron has a certain wave function with a certain energy. When we apply the electric field, both the wave function and the energy get perturbed, and it is these perturbations that we want to calculate. The unperturbed wave function satisfies the Schrodinger equation with the unperturbed Hamiltonian, which we can write as the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. The perturbed wave function must satisfy the Schrodinger equation with the perturbed Hamiltonian, which contains an extra term for the potential energy. We can write the Hamiltonian operator as the unperturbed Hamiltonian plus a perturbation. And we assume that the perturbation to the Hamiltonian is small, so that the perturbations to the wave function and the energy are also small. The product of two small perturbations becomes extremely small, so we ignore these terms. The resulting equation can be simplified by subtracting the Schrodinger equation for the unperturbed system. To find from this equation an expression for the energy perturbation, we recall the properties of the Hamiltonian operator and its eigenvectors. The Hamiltonian is Hermitian, from which it follows that its normalized eigenvectors are orthonormal. When we take on both sides the inner product with the unperturbed wave function, we can simplify one term because the eigenvectors are orthonormal and we can simplify another term because the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, and the unperturbed wave function is an eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. We then find the same term on both sides of the equation, so it can be cancelled. We end up with an explicit expression for the energy perturbation. Note that this expression can be interpreted as the diagonal matrix element of the perturbation to the Hamiltonian when it is expressed in the energy basis. So we now know how to calculate the energy perturbation. How do we calculate the perturbation to the wave function? We can rearrange the equation we found previously and observe that the right hand side is completely known now that we found the energy perturbation. Therefore, this equation can be solved with the standard method for solving inhomogeneous differential equations. The standard way to do it is to first find the homogeneous solution, where the right-hand side of the equation is set to zero. In this case, the equation reduces to the Schrodinger equation of the unperturbed system, which we know is solved by the unperturbed wave function. Then we find the particular solution, where the right-hand side is not set to zero. Since the known eigenvectors of the unperturbed Schrodinger equation form a complete basis, we can write the perturbation to the wave function as a linear combination of the unperturbed wave functions. Then, to solve this equation, we only need to find the coefficients for this expansion. There is at least one coefficient we can find very straightforwardly. Because of the linearity of the differential equation, any homogeneous solution can be added to the particular solution, and the result would still solve the differential equation. Since the homogeneous solutions are some of the basis functions in which we expand the solution, we are free to set their coefficients to zero. To find the other coefficients, we plug the expansion into the differential equation and use the fact that the basis functions are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator. 
when we take on both sides of the equation the inner product with one of the basis functions, we isolate one term of the expansion, because the basis functions are orthonormal. Moreover, one term on the right side vanishes for the same reason. The remaining term is an inner product involving the perturbation to the Hamiltonian. Solving for the coefficients and plugging them into the expansion gives an explicit expression for the perturbation to the wave function. Note that we avoid division by zero because we excluded the homogeneous solution from the expansion. Moreover, note that the inner products correspond to the off-diagonal elements of the matrix that represents the perturbation to the Hamiltonian in the energy basis. So we found the expressions for the perturbation to the energy and the perturbation to the wave function that are due to a constant perturbation in the Hamiltonian. In Sommerfeld's atomic model, there are degenerate energy levels. That is, there are different electron orbits that have the same energy if no perturbation is applied. So the wave functions are different, but the energies, and therefore the oscillation frequencies, are the same. This means that both wave functions are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator with the same eigenvalues. From this it follows that any linear combination of the two wave functions is also an eigenfunction with the same eigenvalue. Since the two eigenfunctions have the same time dependence, any linear combination of the two gives another wave function with a single oscillation frequency. When we apply a constant perturbation, the different orbits respond differently to the perturbation. Now the different orbits will have different energies, so the degeneracy is lifted, which means that in experiment we see spectral lines split. Mathematically, it means that when we apply a perturbation to the Hamiltonian, the two perturbed wave functions now have different eigenvalues. This means that now the perturbed wave functions oscillate with different frequencies. If we consider how a linear combination of eigenfunctions is affected by the perturbation, we observe something important. Whereas the unperturbed state oscillates with a single frequency, the perturbed state will oscillate with multiple frequencies. This means that an important assumption in the perturbation theory that we discussed a moment ago is violated. We assumed that an eigenfunction before the perturbation will remain an eigenfunction after the perturbation. However, this turns out not to be the case in general if the energy level is degenerate. In that case, there are certain unperturbed eigenfunctions which are the right ones to apply perturbation theory to. That is, they remain eigenfunctions after the perturbation is applied. And there are wrong states to apply perturbation theory to. That is, they stop being eigenfunctions once the perturbation is applied. The way to find these correct states is described in what's called degenerate perturbation theory. The procedure is certainly not trivial, but we will not discuss it here. Rather, we will just assume that the unperturbed state we work with is the right one to apply perturbation theory to. We have now seen how a constant perturbation affects the electron wave function and energy. However, to explain the phenomenon of dispersion, we need to consider an oscillating perturbation, which corresponds to the oscillating potential of the electric field of the incident radiation. So let's see how we can use time-dependent perturbation theory to explain dispersion. If there is no perturbation present, the electron wave function satisfies the time-dependent Schrödinger equation. When we introduce a time-dependent perturbation to the Hamiltonian, it introduces a time-dependent variation to the wave function. The magnitude of the perturbation scales with the magnitude of the electric field of the incident radiation. The magnitude of the perturbation to the wave function is of the same order. When we assume the perturbation is small, the terms that go with the square of the perturbation strength can be neglected. 
We can simplify this equation further by subtracting the time-dependent Schrodinger equation without perturbation. We rearrange the terms so that the perturbation to the wave function occurs only on the left side. The right side of the equation is completely known. To solve the resulting differential equation, we assume that before the perturbation was applied, the electron was in a state of a single energy. We can rewrite the cosine in the perturbation as the sum of two exponentials by using Euler's formula. We can plug these expressions in the differential equation. Now we make an educated guess for the solution to this differential equation. We guess that the solution can be written as the sum of two functions, whose time dependence are the same as the terms in the right side of the differential equation. When solving for the first function, we ignore the term in the differential equation with the wrong time dependence. When we plug the expression for the solution into the differential equation, we find that we can eliminate the time dependence, so we end up with a time-independent differential equation. We can do the same thing for the second function. Ignore the term in the differential equation with the wrong time dependence, plug in the expression for the solution, so that we end up with a time-independent differential equation. When we plug in the total expression for the solution into the time-dependent differential equation, and we assume that both functions satisfy their time-independent differential equations, we can verify that, indeed, we found a valid solution to the time-dependent differential equation. So we have reduced the time-dependent differential equation to two separate time-independent differential equations. To solve these two equations, recall the results we obtained from time-independent perturbation theory. We recognize that our current differential equation is of the same form that we found earlier. Therefore, we can directly copy the result that we found previously to solve the current equation. We now have all the ingredients necessary to construct the solution for the perturbed wave function. We write the perturbed wave function as the unperturbed wave function plus the perturbation. We write the perturbation as the sum of two functions, each with a different time dependence. Finally, we plug in the results that we borrowed from time-independent perturbation theory. Note that we can write the inner product as a matrix element of Heisenberg's matrix mechanics. Now that we have found an expression for the electron's wave function that is perturbed by incident radiation, we will now see how the electron re-emits radiation. Schrödinger interpreted the squared modulus of the wave function as a charge's density, which emits radiation according to the classical laws of electrodynamics. When we calculate the squared modulus of the wave function, we ignore the term that scales with the square of the perturbation strength, because we assume the perturbation to be small. So when we calculate the charge density, we find one squared term and two cross terms, which are each other's complex conjugates. To find the radiation that is emitted by this oscillating charge distribution, we calculate its dipole moment. The integral of the squared term can be written as a diagonal matrix element. The integrals of the cross terms yield off-diagonal matrix elements. We can further simplify the resulting expression as follows. We use the fact that the position matrix is Hermitian to combine the two sums into a single sum. We write the sum of two complex exponentials as a cosine by using Euler's formula. We write the sum of two fractions as one fraction, and we observe that the electric field magnitude times the cosine is the same as the incident electric field. We have now successfully rederived the quantum formula for dispersion by using Schrodinger's wave mechanics. By now, we have demonstrated quite convincingly the validity of the Schrodinger equation. Its derivation was based on the Broglie hypothesis and on a plausible analogy with optics. Just like light rays are actually waves, so too are particles actually waves. 
With the Schrödinger equation, we can derive the existence of quantum numbers, which were already part of Sommerfeld's atomic model. We also derive the energy levels that Bohr had derived. By interpreting the squared modulus of Schrödinger's wave equation as the charge's density, we derived using classical electrodynamics that the radiation frequency is given by the difference in energy levels, as was already known from Bohr's atomic model. We demonstrated the connection between Schrödinger's wave mechanics and Heisenberg's matrix mechanics by representing operators as matrices in the energy basis. That is, the basis vectors are given by the solutions to the time-independent Schrödinger equation. Finally, we demonstrated that with perturbation theory, we can derive from Schrödinger's wave mechanics the quantum formula for dispersion, which had served as a major inspiration for the development of matrix mechanics. But in spite of all its successes, there was still a major discrepancy between what the Schrödinger equation predicts and what is observed in experiment. The observations we're talking about are those made with the Wilson cloud chamber. In such a cloud chamber, the trajectories of particles are made visible by the trails they leave behind in a supersaturated vapor. These trails show no hints of wave-like phenomena such as diffraction. Instead, the trajectories appear to be like those of ordinary particles, with definite positions and momenta. This discrepancy was readily recognized by Schrödinger. Also Heisenberg, who claimed that according to matrix mechanics the trajectories of electrons cannot be visualized, noted the clear contradiction with the observations of the Wilson cloud chamber. Max Born later recalled how Schrödinger's interpretation of his wave function was met with skepticism because of the particle trajectories observed in the cloud chamber. It was Born who came up with the currently more accepted interpretation of Schrödinger's wave function. He did so when he studied the quantum mechanics of particle scattering. Particle scattering theory had been used, for example, by Rutherford to infer the structure of the atom. But now that, in quantum theory, particles are described as waves, the scattering theory of particles becomes more similar to scattering of light in optics. For the sake of simplicity, Born first considered the case of scattering in a single dimension. A moving particle can be described with some wave function that propagates freely. To have it scatter, we introduce a perturbation to the otherwise flat potential. Before the wave function interacts with the potential, it propagates only to the right. But after the collision, a part of the wave function gets reflected to the left, while the remainder is transmitted and continues propagating to the right. The way that the wave function splits in two is determined by the Schrödinger equation. To calculate exactly how much of the wave is reflected and how much is transmitted, Born used conservation of energy. In optics, the squared modulus of a field is its intensity, and it is proportional to the energy density. The total energy of the field is therefore proportional to the intensity integrated over all space. We imagine similarly a total energy of a quantum mechanical wave, even though the terminology may be a bit confusing because the energy was already defined as the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian operator. Nonetheless, let's just go with this newly defined total energy and derive conservation of energy by taking its time derivative and demonstrating that it's zero. To take the time derivative of the squared modulus, we have to apply the product rule. Next, we rewrite the time derivatives using the Schrödinger equation. Because the Hamiltonian operator is Hermitian, the two terms cancel, and the expression reduces to zero. Hence, we have demonstrated conservation of some sort of energy. By using this principle of energy conservation, Born calculated how the wave function is split in two after interacting with the scattering potential. However, this quantum mechanical wave function represents a particle, and it is experimentally observed that when a particle gets scattered by a potential, 
it does not get split in two. Rather, it stays intact, and it gets either entirely reflected or entirely transmitted. Therefore, we cannot speak of the reflected and transmitted amplitude, but only of the probability for reflection and transmission. The squared modulus of the wave function seems to indicate a probability distribution, and the conservation of energy that we just derived is actually a guarantee that the probability that the particle exists somewhere is not changed after the collision. After having examined scattering in one dimension, Born considered two more cases. The three-dimensional case is relevant in the context of Rutherford scattering. A particle is fired at an atomic nucleus, and then scatters in a certain direction. In quantum mechanics, the incident particle is a wave, which gets scattered in many different directions. But experimentally, we see the scattered particle going in only one direction. So the scattered wave describes the probability in which the particle will be traveling. One can also consider the case of scattering by an atom that can be excited into higher states of energy. This is for example relevant in the Frank Hertz experiment. If a quantum mechanical wave function is incident on the atom, then the atom's electron gets partially excited and the incident wave is scattered in many different directions. Except the atom's electron is never observed to be partially excited. It's always either excited to the next energy level, or it's not excited at all. And the scattered particle is not split in many different directions, it goes in only one definite direction. So this also confirms that the quantum mechanical wave function describes some sort of probability. So to summarize, Born used the Schrodinger equation to predict what will happen when particles collide. Then he compared those predictions to what is experimentally observed. He then logically concluded that the wave function must be interpreted as a probability distribution. This raises several new questions. Do we describe particles with a probability distribution because they are fundamentally waves of probability? Or does the probability distribution simply reflect our ignorance? And should we be able to formulate a more fundamental theory that contains no uncertainties, but rather additional variables that are currently hidden to us? If particles are indeed fundamentally waves of probability, then what happens to the probability distribution once we observe the particle? After all, once we observe a particle, there is no uncertainty anymore about where it is. So the probability distribution and the wave function should collapse upon observation. If the wave function indeed collapses after observation, does that happen instantaneously, or does it occur with a finite speed, because nothing can travel faster than light? But what even counts as an observation or measurement exactly? If all matter obeys the Schrodinger equation, and the Schrodinger equation does not predict any collapse of the wave function, then how could an observation, whatever that is, ever cause a wave function to collapse? Do we need something beyond matter, such as consciousness, to make a wave function collapse? When presented in this way, it may seem as if interpreting Schrodinger's wave equation as a probability distribution was the result of a clear and straightforward line of reasoning, as is required by the scientific method. The questions that followed would also have to be resolved by doing careful experiments and logically interpreting their results. However, the lively discussions on the interpretation of quantum theory that persist to this day reveal the fundamental role that faith and philosophy play in science. To understand the motivations behind these discussions on the interpretation of quantum mechanics, recall what Schrödinger thought he had achieved with his equation. Heisenberg, Born and Jordan developed matrix mechanics, which they said was fundamentally unintuitive and it could not be visualized. 
Schrödinger tried to return to a more intuitive type of physics. He showed that matrix mechanics is equivalent to wave mechanics, which people were very familiar with, which is intuitive, and which can be visualized. He thought the wave function represented a well-defined continuous distribution of electrical charge, whose evolution in time is determined by a wave equation. The way this charge distribution emits radiation is determined by the classical laws of electrodynamics. This is completely in line with all of Newtonian physics, where the laws of physics are fully deterministic. That is, given some initial state of a system, and some equations that describe the time evolution of the system, all future states of the system are determined as soon as the initial state was defined. Any uncertainty is only due to our ignorance, not due to the fundamental laws of physics. But now, Born formulated a fundamental law of physics that was explicitly non-deterministic. The wave function that describes an electron only describes the probability where we might find the electron if we were to measure it, and there is no way to determine with certainty in advance where the electron will be. When Born proposed this idea, he recognized how it clashed with the worldview that Newtonian physics had created. But ultimately, he concluded, the question of whether the world should be deterministic or not is a philosophical question. Scientists such as Einstein, Schrödinger and de Broglie, who themselves made significant contributions to quantum theory, did not accept the idea that the laws of physics are fundamentally non-deterministic. Einstein had extensive discussions with Bohr, known as the Bohr-Einstein debates, about whether uncertainty is a fundamental part of physical reality. Einstein furthermore proposed that there must be hidden variables, which are not yet known to us, but which would make the laws of physics deterministic again once we take them into account. Up to this day, no conclusive experimental evidence for the existence of hidden variables has been found, though experiments known as Bell tests have ruled out the existence of local hidden variables. Max Born reflected on this strong resistance to the idea of non-determinism. On what basis would such a strong rejection be justified? He concluded that mechanical determinism had become an article of faith after the immense success of Newtonian physics. In support of this conclusion is a letter from Einstein to Born about his attempts to return to a deterministic theory of physics. In that letter, Einstein explicitly admits that he is absolutely convinced that the laws of physics should be deterministic but he cannot provide any logical arguments for this conviction. Born then reflects on the fact that even an exact science like physics is based on fundamental beliefs that cannot be logically substantiated, and that he himself also holds beliefs that he can only accept as an act of faith. One important example of such a faith-based fundamental idea is the idea that humans have free will. If humans are purely material beings, and all material obeys deterministic laws of physics, then all actions are predetermined, and humans cannot have any free will. Therefore, if we believe that humans do have free will, then we would accept with no problem the conclusion from quantum mechanics that the fundamental laws of physics are non-deterministic. The only reason to actively resist drawing this conclusion in spite of carefully examined experimental evidence, is some other faith-based fundamental idea, from which it follows that the laws of physics have to be deterministic. So to better understand the issue of interpreting quantum mechanics, we must understand the role of fundamental faith-based beliefs in science. Why do some people strongly believe in free will? Why do other people strongly believe in determinism? There may be as many different reasons for these beliefs as there are people, because the reasons for faith-based beliefs are highly personal. Therefore, 
What will now follow is my own personal take, which may appear somewhat unsophisticated to a more serious philosopher, but hopefully it can nonetheless help illustrate the point that Born seems to be making, and perhaps it can help us understand why there is still so much heated discussion about the interpretation of quantum mechanics even to this day. So let's start by asking, why do we care whether free will exists? Free will is necessary to make sense of morality and judgment. We typically believe that there are some actions or beliefs which are right and some which are wrong. People are assumed to have the free will to choose what they do or believe. They can do or believe the right thing or the wrong thing. And then they are judged accordingly. If people did not have free will, it wouldn't make sense to hold them accountable for their actions or beliefs. For example, it wouldn't make sense to judge a rock for falling on someone's head. In a world without free will, a criminal had no choice but to commit a crime, and the judge had no choice but to hold the criminal accountable for their actions. Moreover, if person A tries to persuade person B that free will doesn't exist, it's futile for person A to do so, because person B cannot choose to change their own mind. But similarly, person A cannot choose to stop trying to persuade person B. To avoid such an absurd worldview, we assume that free will exists. But this implies that not everything is predetermined. And this means that the laws of physics cannot predetermine everything. So belief in free will is necessary to hold people accountable for their actions and beliefs. But why should we care about accountability and judgment? Is it not better to be non-judgmental and to not moralize? The belief in a moral law and judgment according to it should give people the freedom to live a life of value. One might think that rules and judgment reduce one's freedom. But the opposite should be true. A person may feel more free and purposeful in a civil society with rule of law than in a completely chaotic anarchy. Enforcement of moral law should allow one to live without fear for serious physical or psychological harm inflicted by either others or oneself, either purposefully or out of ignorance. It should ensure that human beings are not reduced to tools or objects of entertainment. To legitimize the enforcement of moral beliefs onto others, it must be assumed that these beliefs are objectively true, and not just a mere matter of personal opinion. For example, it's okay to indoctrinate children with the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4, because that's objectively true. It's not okay to enforce the belief that Far Cry 3 is a great game, because... That's a subjective, philosophical point of fucking view. So, if we enforce as a society the belief that, for example, murder is wrong, it seems to imply that on some level, we assume that this idea is objectively true. We see how this lays the foundation for religious traditions and institutions which explicitly acknowledge the belief that moral values express some objective truth and that this truth can only be accepted through faith. However, morality and judgment also come with the serious danger of wrongful judgment, either intentionally or unintentionally. Even if we could all agree on the existence of some objectively true moral law, Properly understanding it can still be extremely difficult, in the same way that it is difficult to fully understand the objectively true laws of physics. In a more sinister vein, morality and judgment may be abused for self-glorification, exploitation and coercion. Somebody may preach morality just to show off their own moral superiority or they use shame and guilt to manipulate others. For these reasons, it may be tempting to use the successes of the natural sciences 
to delegitimize the idea that there is an objective moral law that others can impose on us. The natural sciences can explain a great deal of observations by assuming that the universe is purely material and that all material follows deterministic laws of physics. If the universe is purely material, then there can be no immaterial moral law. If the universe is fully deterministic, then there can be no free will. If there is no objective moral law and we don't have free will, then there are no legitimate grounds for judging someone. So no one can judge another person, no one can claim moral superiority, and no one can use the threat of moral judgment to coerce others. Moreover, science has greatly improved our lives through technology, whereas religion at times stood in the way of scientific progress, such as in the case of Galileo. One might say that subjective religious beliefs are not supported by objective empirical evidence. They can appear ambiguous, self-contradictory, and contrary to common moral and logical sense. Moreover, they can be judgmental, oppressive, and the cause of many unnecessary conflicts. Its wishful thinking can sometimes stifle scientific progress. Science, on the other hand, is where we dispassionately examine the objective empirical evidence and accept its conclusions regardless of what we wish to be true. This has advanced our civilization and helped us move on from Bronze Age superstition. When we take all of this into consideration, it makes sense, as Born observed, that determinism, as revealed by Newtonian mechanics, is practically elevated to an article of faith. But in spite of all this, there are still people to whom a purely scientific worldview is not quite that satisfactory. For example, if in this purely material universe there exists no objective moral right or wrong, then there can be nothing morally right about adopting a scientific worldview, and there can be nothing morally wrong with irrationality, wishful thinking, or imposing your own moral beliefs onto others. The only things that exist are personal desires and the power to fulfill them regardless of whether it's at the expense of others. Any sense of wonder that one may feel when viewing pictures of the pale blue dot, or when contemplating the message of the Voyager Golden Records, it would all be purely subjective, and it would be no more valid than the thrill of having others suffer for your entertainment. The desire to preserve the planet's ecosystem would be no better than the desire to consume excessively at the expense of future generations. One desire is not any less moral or less rational than the other. Others who hold a purely materialistic worldview may still try to uphold the idea of an objective moral truth. They might say that morality is not an arbitrary personal opinion that is imposed on others through oppression, but rather these opinions follow from innate moral instincts that have evolved through Darwinian natural selection. In the context of natural selection, there is an objective basis by which one can say that one system of morality is better than another. But the problem remains. Science and the theory of evolution may explain observations, but they fail to guide our motivations. Evolution may explain how belief in morality helps the propagation of genetic material similar to my own. However, it does not explain why I should personally care about my genetic material more than about my own personal desires. Why should I ever choose to selflessly sacrifice any part of myself in the same way an ant would sacrifice itself for its colony? Why should I take my moral instinct seriously? Why should I take my instinct for logic seriously? Why should I not take my instinct for religion and superstition seriously? After all, in a purely materialistic worldview, all of these instincts are equally arbitrary byproducts of evolution. 
Some people indeed seriously argue that everything we experience is a meaningless illusion, created by our biological hardwiring, which is a result of purposeless evolution. They argue that there is no objective truth, that there is no objective right or wrong, neither logically nor morally. But if that is so, then it's hard to say that their worldview is right and that people who do believe in an objective truth are wrong. So it is far from obvious that science can be a satisfactory substitute for all faith-based beliefs. The belief that being rational is morally good is itself a faith-based belief. And it only makes sense to preach the goodness of rationality if we believe that people have the free will to choose to be rational. And it means that people who engage in wishful and hopeful thinking are judged to be bad. And whether rational thinking is always good and wishful thinking is always bad is not completely obvious. Therefore, science can also not avoid the problem of dogmatic morality and judgment for which religion has been criticized. Moral values such as rationality, open-mindedness, and non-judgment also stem from some faith-based belief, for which science cannot provide a justification or substitute. And these beliefs can be as ambiguous, self-contradictory, and contrary to common sense as traditional religious beliefs are. If these beliefs are not acknowledged as being faith-based, because they're just so obviously true to any true follower of rationality, then it only makes them more dogmatic. The arguments that were presented just now are at best a very naive and simplistic introduction to the discussion about faith, free will, morality and determinism. Many books on this topic have been written, and there is no doubt that many more will be written in the future. But hopefully these arguments illustrate that it's understandable why some people may want to use science to make all faith-based beliefs obsolete, while others believe that science, in spite of all its impressive achievements, should still leave space for discussion about more religious concepts, such as free will and the nature of consciousness. The relation between faith and science remains a complicated one. On the one hand, Science is based on skepticism and observable evidence, which seems to be the polar opposite of faith. On the other hand, as we saw in Einstein's letter, scientists use faith-based beliefs to guess which scientific models make sense and which need to be improved upon. In the final episode of the TV series Cosmos, Carl Sagan contrasted faith-based religious thinking to scientific thinking by saying that the only sacred truth is that there are no sacred truths. This certainly is a very poetic and concise way to describe the scientific mindset and to set it apart from a faith-based mindset. But it is also blatantly self-contradictory. To resolve this contradiction, one can interpret the first sacred truth as a faith-based moral truth. The other sacred truths are truths about the material world that can be verified empirically. So even the scientific or skeptic mindset relies on a faith-based assumption that there is some moral good to science and skepticism. In 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville commented on the role of faith in early American society. He claimed that liberty requires morality and morality requires faith. He was concerned that those who advocate acquiring knowledge, advancing civilization, and prioritizing intelligence do so without any faith or principles. A century later, Max Born reflects on the role of chance in the laws of physics, and he concluded something similar. He objected to the idea that the scientific method should replace all other beliefs, noting that faith and intuition remain important for making progress in science and any other human activity. According to Born, the greatest blessing of modern science 
which includes the remarkable results of quantum mechanics, is what he called the loosening of thinking. The successes of Newtonian mechanics made us question certain religious dogmas, and the successes of quantum theory might make us reconsider certain dogmas in science. On the one hand, we should be able to justify our beliefs on rational grounds. Yet at the same time, we cannot deny the fundamental importance of faith-based beliefs in science and in our lives in general. These paradoxical nuances should discourage anyone from claiming too confidently that they possess the single ultimate truth. Returning to the topic of quantum mechanics, what do we therefore make of all its different interpretations? Why are there so many? And how do we decide which interpretation is most sensible in the absence of conclusive experimental evidence? For a large part, it comes down to what faith-based belief you happen to hold. What feels the least absurd to you? That we have no free will and everything we do, think and say is predetermined? That there are infinitely many universes where all possible scenarios occur? That nature is fundamentally random? Or that consciousness has origins beyond the material world and that it can affect the material world? Whatever answer we give to these questions, it is my belief that, most importantly, like Einstein we should be able to recognize what faith-based assumption we are making and openly admit that it is indeed faith-based.